So the women of the U.S. national team are appealing a federal judge's dismissal of their gender discrimination claims. And here's why. Hey, my name is Nate the Lawyer. Welcome to my YouTube channel. If it's your first time here, don't forget to like this video, share this video, and subscribe to the channel if you like what you hear. Let's get into it. So today we're going to look at the U.S. Women's National Team's appeal from a federal court's dismissal of their equal pay claims. Now, if you want to know why the Women's National Team lawsuit was dismissed, click on this link. This will give you all the details that you need to know. Also, I suggest you watch that video before watching this video so you can have a full understanding on why the judge threw out, and I mean threw out, their gender discrimination lawsuit. But here is the quick and dirty, so you don't have to watch that whole video before watching this one. So what happened at the lower court? Well, the judge made a couple of factual findings that you need to understand before we even go into the appeal. Well, the first thing that court found was that the women's team got paid more than the men, both on a per game basis, their rate of pay happened to be higher, and overall, they got more money overall than the men. So if you're claiming discrimination, the court was like, well, hold on. How can they be discriminating against you guys if they're paying you more on a per game basis and overall? Number two. The court found that U.S. soccer offered the women the men's deal, and the women rejected it. Why did the women reject it? Well, the court found that the women rejected it for guaranteed money. They wanted money that was guaranteed. See, the men play on a pay-to-play schedule, so if there's no games, they don't get paid. Where the women are salaried employees, that means they get paid no matter what. So, for instance, remember last year when we had the global pandemic where there was no soccer games? Well, no men from the men's national team got paid because they only get paid if they play in a game. But the women's national team, those 20 women who got the $100,000 salary as they negotiated, they still got paid. They got paid their $100,000 salary and full benefits during the pandemic when the men got nothing from U.S. soccer. But don't take my word for it. Let's actually read what the judge wrote in his opinion, this approach, merely comparing what each team would have made under the other team's CBA is untenable. In this case, because it ignores the reality that the men's national team and women's national team bargain for different agreements which reflect different preferences. And that the women's national team explicitly rejected the terms they now seek to retroactively impose on themselves. The first time the women's national team requested bonuses equivalent to those received by the men's national team was in January 2016. United States Soccer Federation rejected that proposal, however, because the women's national team was not asking for a pay-to-play arrangement similar to the men's national team CBA. Instead, it was asking for all the upsides of the men's national team CBA, namely higher bonuses, without any of the drawbacks. No base salary. In May 2016, the United States Soccer Federation offered the women's national team a pay-to-play proposal similar to the men's national team CBA, but the women's national team rejected it preferring an arrangement that involves some elements of guaranteed compensation. So essentially, the women took guaranteed salary over the risk of a play-to-play schedule. And when they found out that they could make more on the play-to-play schedule, they said, discrimination, even though we signed the agreement. So now that you know the facts, let's talk about the appeal. Now, in my last video about this topic, I bought Employment Lawyer Legal Bites to help me explain the structure of the agreements. But this time, we're on appeal. So who better to bring in than an attorney who goes over appellate cases here on YouTube? His name is Uncivil Law. Check it out. Hi, everyone. My name is Kurt, and I run the channel Uncivil Law. <laughs> Nate asked me to participate in this discussion because this is on appeal, and on my channel, I mainly cover appellate law cases. Appellate law is the best. You don't have to worry about what the facts are. The trial court already took care of all that. Instead, you can laser focus on the law and see what the correct legal result should be. All right, so what's happening on appeal? Well, first, the issue here is, is did the lower court or the district court make a mistake in granting summary judgment for the United States Soccer Federation? The representatives of the women's national team have made two arguments on why the lower court's ruling should be reversed. First, they say the district court used the wrong legal standards in assessing the women's national team players' claims of unequal pay. And their second argument is that the district court disregarded all of their evidence that they were paid unequally. And by disregarding that evidence, the court made an error in dismissing their case. So let's look at their first argument. Here's uncivil law. The first legal argument has three major components. The first component, the women argue because the men 
can win up to $9 million in bonuses because their rate of pay is higher, the law demands that their rate of pay also be equal. And that the lower court found that the women bargained for a guaranteed salary and benefits instead of taking the risk of losing. Second, the women argue that the law demands an employer must pay a woman the same amount it pays a man for an equal measure of work. The lower court found that the women got paid more, both cumulatively and on a per game basis. The women actually were better off than the men. Third, they argue that the work in this situation should be measured both by the number of games that were played and the results that are achieved. The Federation, after all, they argue, pays players not just merely to play, but to win, and therefore winning should mean more money. The district court found that they did in fact make more money per game and overall, and they had rejected the deal that would have paid them more for winning. They wanted guaranteed money. In legal briefings submitted to the Ninth Circuit, the women argue that the trial court's main error was in failing to take the success of the women's team into account. But how about actual evidence of discrimination? Well, to discuss that, here's Nate. So Kurt's broken down the first argument for the women's national team, but now let's look at the second argument on appeal. The women's national team claims that the district court erred in dismissing the women's national team's players' evidence of pay discrimination. Well, first, they point to statements by Federation officials acknowledging that the women's national team and the men's national team were not paid equally, and specifically that this differential treatment was because of sex. Former Federation President Sunil Galati confirmed that he, quote, would never have authorized paying the women and men the same bonuses. They also point to statements made by former Federation President Carlos Cordero, which he acknowledged that female players had not been treated equally and the Federation clearly needed to work toward equal pay for the national teams. Last, they point to the Federation's counsel who stated during the collective bargaining agreement that the market realities are that the women do not deserve equal pay. Now, the women believe that these statements were essentially ignored by the court. The second piece of direct evidence the women believe that the court ignored was obvious disparities in the terms of the women's and men's collective bargaining agreements. Specifically, that if the women would have been paid under the men's deal, they would have collectively made, I believe, $66 million more than what they made under their own deal. But the lower court addressed this. See, the lower court stated that the women's team requested and agreed to the deal because they wanted guarantees that the men didn't have. See, the women's national team is only looking at it from the upside proportion, right? How much could we have made? But they're not looking at it from the downside perspective. See, the women had capped their downside because they got guaranteed money, $100,000 a year salaries. Think about during the pandemic. The men made no money because they couldn't play any games. So their downside was zero, where the women's downside was $100,000 and all of these benefits. So the women's national team is saying, well, look, look, we could have made $66 million more. But then the court said, well, yeah, you could have also made zero. That's why you get guaranteed salaries that the men don't get and all the benefits. Next, the women's national team says that the Federation never offered the women the same deal as the men, that the deal was just similar. Now, to be fair, the court did say that the women were offered the same pay structure as the men. Hold on a second, Nate. That's not right. Even the players are saying that they were offered the exact same deal as the men. So now that the thing that worries me, and we, we, we can d discuss, you know, this at greater length, maybe some other time, but the only issue is that Megan led the team into signing a less than equal CBA. We were so close to having equal pay in 2016. It was set forth. It, it, it was offered to us. We were so again, we see a contradiction between what the women's team has said publicly and what they've said in their official legal filings. We were so close to having equal pay in 2016. It was set forth, it, it, it was offered to us. We were... Well, the next piece of evidence the women's team says that the court overlooked is that the experts confirmed that the agreements were nowhere near equal in value. The women's team argues that the experts have confirmed that the agreement from the women, as compared with the men, were nowhere near equal in value. The lower court did accept that expert's findings, but they reasoned 
that the women's team only wanted the upside, that is the higher bonuses, but none of the downsides of the men's deal, that is no guaranteed money. The men's deal could have been worth millions more, but it could also be worth millions less. In fact, technically it could be worth zero because there's no guaranteed money. It's salary versus commission. And last but not least, they argue that the women could have made more if they had been paid under the men's agreement. Now, this is true, but the court found that the men would have been paid more if they were under the women's agreement. So now, should both teams be able to sue for discrimination because they negotiated poor deals for themselves? So this is why the U.S. Women's National Team is asking a federal appeals court to overturn the judgment of the lower court. You be the jury. What do you think about this appeal? Do you think the women's team has good arguments against the lower court findings? If you want to go over all their arguments in detail, visit me here on my channel, and we'll go over the entire brief in longer technical detail. And while you're there, don't forget to subscribe. Now, I want to thank my buddy on Civil Law. He does fantastic work on his channel going in-depth into these appeals cases. My name is Nate DeLore. You can check me out on Locals.com. Click here for some more great content, and I'm going to see you next time.